destroyer of worlds. Hello, my little honeybees, and welcome to Oppenheimer in a Bombshell. Oppenheimer. Industrial might and scientific innovation connected here. Secret laboratory. Keep everyone there until it's done. Let's go recruit some scientists. Build a town, build it fast. If we don't let scientists bring their families, we'll never get the best. Why would we go to the middle of nowhere for who knows how long? Why? How about because this is the most important thing that ever happened in the history of the world? You're the great improviser, but this... You can't do in your head. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world? Chances are near zero. Near zero. What do you want from theory alone? Zero would be nice. Oppenheimer was nominated and won the Academy Award for Best Picture. If you saw it or not, I wonder if you agree. I do. They also nominated many of the actors as well as, as, well as many other things within the movie for many reasons. You also get a glimpse with inside the mind of Oppenheimer himself through images of atoms splitting interpreted through lights, fireworks, and many other images that show to want to show you for those who maybe could not take the length of the movie or do not want to fully or who could not fully understand what was going on and maybe turn the movie off. The actual history that the actual history of the brilliant man who was Oppenheimer the brilliant mad scientist who brought us the atom bomb. J. Robert Oppenheimer might be the most important physicist to have ever lived. He never won a Nobel Prize, but he changed the world more than most Nobel Prize winners. Under his leadership, the best physicists of the 20th century built the atomic bomb forever changing the course of history. 
if there is another world war, this civilization may go under. He has affected every war waged and every peace settled since the end of World War II. He also created a way for humanity to destroy itself. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. This video is about how to build an atomic bomb, the life of Oppenheimer, and why serious scientists were worried about the explosion setting fire to the atmosphere, ending all life on Earth. Robert Oppenheimer was 21, he placed an apple laced with toxic chemicals on the desk of his physics tutor. The tutor, Patrick Blackett, was an experimentalist, and he had hounded Robert to do more of what he thought Robert wasn't very good at, experimental work. Oppenheimer had already been spending his days in a corner of J.J. Thompson's basement laboratory, attempting to make thin films of beryllium, which were used to study electrons. But Oppenheimer was clumsy and not good at this work. He was soon avoiding his duties in the lab, spending his time listening to lectures and reading physics journals. It was 1925 and the 21-year-old Oppenheimer was becoming fascinated by the new field of quantum mechanics. Despite being surrounded by brilliant physicists like Rutherford and Chadwick, Oppenheimer was deeply unhappy. He wrote, I'm having a pretty bad time. The lab work is a terrible bore, and I'm so bad at it that it's impossible to feel that I'm learning anything. A friend walked in on him lying on the floor of his room, which he called a miserable hole, groaning and rolling from side to side in emotional anguish. It was in this state that Robert attempted to poison Blackett. The specifics are lost to history. There are conflicting reports if Oppenheimer used cyanide or something he found in the lab which would have just made Blackett sick. This story sounds unbelievable, but Oppenheimer himself confirmed it. Luckily, Blackett did not eat the apple, but the attempted poisoning became known to the Cambridge University authorities. Robert's parents were visiting their son from the U.S. at the time, and Julius Oppenheimer successfully lobbied Cambridge not to press criminal charges. Due to his family's wealth, Robert wasn't even expelled from Cambridge, on the condition that he had periodic counseling sessions with a psychiatrist in London. In the summer of 1926, Robert traveled to the University of Göttingen. The chairman of the department was Max Born, who just two years earlier had coined the term quantum mechanics. Born was reportedly a thoughtful and gentle teacher, and had nurtured the work of Werner Heisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, Enrico Fermi, and Eugene Wigner, basically the who's who of quantum mechanics. The class that Oppenheimer was in was also extraordinary, including luminaries like Paul Dirac and John von Neumann. Where the academic culture at Cambridge focused on experimental physics, Göttingen was all about theoretical physics, and under Max Born's mentorship, Oppenheimer thrived. His mental health improved, and he found a community of people who were as obsessed with physics as he was. On November 14th, 1926, Robert wrote to Frank, his younger brother, you would like Göttingen. I find the work hard, thank God, and almost pleasant. Isaki were civilians. Most were women and children. In 1965, recalling the moments after the Trinity test, Oppenheimer said that he thought of another... I just want to point out that now we're getting more into the destruction of the bomb itself. Please note that at first, yes, the bomb was intended for the Nazis, but it was not finished in time and then was used for Japan, it hit more of civilians than anything else. Another verse from the Gita. He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. In the film, you do see that it shows Oppenheimer's guilt throughout the movie after he finds out and realizes, of course, the destruction his bomb caused so many civilians in Japan. Also 
most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. After the war, Oppenheimer was a national hero. His I have that phrase repeated a lot. I have become death. That is how he felt. Why do you think Oppenheimer felt he has become death? Please leave that in the comments below. I think I know the answer. Why do you think someone who made such a massive destructive weapon feels they are responsible for so many lives? Tell me. Just like in the film, if you saw it, when you make one bomb, what comes after? His portrait was on the cover of Time magazine, and he became a household name. In 1947, he became the director of the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. He also became the chairman of the General Advisory Committee, where he became an advisor on nuclear weapons-related issues. He used his position to argue for arms control. Did you hear that? Nuclear weapons. After the atom bomb came the hydrogen bomb. Then nuclear weapons. In August 1949, the Soviet Union tested their first In August 1949, the Soviet Union tested their first atomic weapon. US military quickly decided that the best course of action was to develop a more powerful bomb, the hydrogen bomb known as the super. Oppenheimer was against the development of the super on ethical grounds and the worry that it would start an arms race. But Truman's administration pushed through and three years later, Ivy Mike, the first hydrogen bomb, was tested in the Marshall Islands. It had a yield of 10.4 megatons of tea. This is why I stress people of power sometimes shouldn't have power. In the movie, it shows how Truman pretty much did not care how Oppenheimer felt and laughed at him. Then gave him, as you see, more orders to make more super serious deadly weapons. NT. That's 400 times more powerful than the Trinity test. A hydrogen bomb is actually three bombs in one. A conventional bomb, a fission bomb, and a fusion bomb. The conventional explosives trigger a fission reaction, which increases the temperature and pressure enough to fuse deuterium and tritium together, releasing a huge amount of energy. In 1961, the Soviet Union tested the Tsar Bomba, the most powerful explosion ever detonated. It was another five times more powerful than Ivy Mike, around 2,000 times more powerful than Trinity. This kind of arms race was exactly what Oppenheimer had feared. In part due to his opposition to the hydrogen bomb and due to his calls to avert a nuclear arms race, Oppenheimer was essentially put on trial to revoke his security clearance. He had been surveilled while he was working for the Manhattan Project, but that surveillance didn't stop after he left. Many of the wiretaps were illegal and warrantless. Oppenheimer was questioned about his ties to the Communist Party, including his affair with Gene Tatlock, a Communist Party member while he was leading the Los Alamos lab. He was essentially accused of treason and espionage. In December 1953, Oppenheimer had his security clearance suspended. His face, now grim and in black and white, was once again on the cover of Time.
heart rate and her blood. Tatlock, a Communist Party member, while he was leading the Los Alamos lab. He was essentially accused of treason and espionage. In December 1953, Oppenheimer had his security clearance suspended. His face, now grim and in black and white, was once again on the cover of Time. Uh, now something else in the movie that was in his life and was quite prominent was his love affairs. Um, he was not only discussed as a communist, um, but uh, he was in an affair with a woman who was openly a communist. Um, and he denied being a communist and, um, his wife, um, who he married, who we will get into, um, who had, uh, alcohol problems and mental issues as, as well as Oppenheimer and his mistress, um, well, um, again, I, I think you should take the time to see the movie at a new light. If you gave up on it, power through. Um, again, it's, it's historically the most accurate movie to date. Um, and, um, it sends a very powerful message, um, as well as you learn history from it. Um, and as him being a, uh, very famous Jew and as me being Jewish, um, I was proud even though he made something that brought death. Um, now we're going to get into his mistress and unfortunately, um, again, spoiler coming up, she met a very sad end. So, um... This is, was a pa very powerful scene from the movie, and uh, I'm glad I recorded stuff beforehand. I got a block from the scene, so I might talk just a little bit. Um, sorry, bear with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> unfortunately, it kind of was his fault. Uh, he neglected her and left her and made her and kind of made her believe she was number one and drove her mad. She ended up in a mental institution, as you will see. was the on again, off again lover and mistress of Robert Oppenheimer, the scientist who has been dubbed the father of the atomic bomb. If you've seen Christopher Nolan's recent hit film, you'll know her time on screen. ends suddenly, but what was her life like, and did she really commit suicide, or were darker forces at play? Join me as we explore her story. Jean Frances Tatlock was born on the 21st of February 1914, just a few months before the First World War broke out in Europe. She was born in Ann Arbor in the state of Michigan to John Strong Perry Tatlock and Marjorie Tatlock, nay Fenton. John Tatlock was a well-respected academic of the time, having written extensively on Geoffrey Chaucer and other important figures of medieval English literature, such as the poet John Donne. Eventually authoring over five dozen books, he ensured that the Tatlocks were a learned and well-read family. Owing to John's career, Jean grew up with something of an itinerant lifestyle. She had lived at Stanford University for much of her childhood years, before the family moved to Harvard in Massachusetts in the mid-1920s, and then back to California, just as the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression occurred in 1929. All of this happened as John Tatlock moved from academic post to academic post. 
The economic crisis which spread through the United States ended the glamour of the Roaring Twenties and would shape Jean's political views for the remainder of her life. Despite the 1920s being a decade of fashion, music and economic prosperity, it wasn't all perfect, as crime and unsolved cases were still high. The States, a political organization which had emerged in 1919 after the Russian Revolution and out of a split within the socialist movement in the country. In America, the Communist Party was closely connected to the labor movement and would be at its most influential between the 1930s and the 1950s. Jean became a writer for the Western Worker, a paper published by the Communist Party while she was attending Stanford Medical School in the mid-1930s, having earlier completed her primary degree at Vassar College in New York. In 1941, she finally graduated from Stanford as Stanford as a psychiatrist. Throughout the years, Tatlock's associations with the Communist Party were of considerable consequence. Owing to these connections, she and Robert Oppenheimer would come under continued government surveillance during the Second World War, negatively impacting Oppenheimer's reputation and playing a role in Jean's death. It was while she was at Stanford that Jean first met J. Robert Oppenheimer and began a relationship with him. Oppenheimer was one of the great theoretical physicists of the age. Ten years her senior, she caught his attention owing to her good looks and also her considerable intellect. Oppenheimer later declared that he only really became involved with her from about 1936 onwards and even after this saw her rarely. Yet, this may not be true. He most likely saw her much more than he claimed as he stated this in the context of being questioned by the United States over his potential involvement with the Communist Party. However, it was always a clandestine relationship. They never married, and from the late 1930s onwards, Oppenheimer was more deeply committed to Catherine Puning, who he eventually did marry in 1940. Despite his marriage, many people who knew Oppenheimer stated that Jean was the woman he loved most closely during his life describing Jean as his truest love, and that he was devoted to her. Oppenheimer even proposed to Tatlock twice, but she turned him down both times. While Oppenheimer married Catherine for a range of reasons, most notably the fact that she was pregnant, and because their career pursuits closely aligned, had things been different, he might have married Jean. As her and Oppenheimer's biographers, Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin have noted of her, Jean was a free-spirited woman with a hungry, poetic mind. She was always the one person in the room, whatever the circumstances, who remained unforgettable. It was possibly these qualities which attracted Oppenheimer to her so much. Jean would continue to see Oppenheimer throughout much of the late 19th And remember, back then, it was very taboo to get a divorce. So my guess is that is a big reason why Oppenheimer would never, ever end up with anyone else than the wife he was not too happily married to. 30s. Some of this involved gatherings of the Communist Party of the United States in California, though it should be pointed out that while Jim remained a committed member of the organization, Oppenheimer himself never joined the party, though he certainly associated with many that did. His political sympathies for socialism seemed to have emerged owing to his disdain for Nazism and fascism in Europe, movements which were the sworn enemies of European communism and socialism, particularly following the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War in 1936. As an American of European Jewish ancestry, Oppenheimer had grown to detest the Nazis in the 1930s and this is most likely where his political sympathies primarily emerged from. It was owing to these political leanings that Oppenheimer would become involved with the US government's political efforts to build a nuclear weapon for the use against the Axis powers of Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, and the Empire of Japan. Oppenheimer is famed today owing to the Manhattan Project and the Los Alamos Laboratory, in which he oversaw the development of the first nuclear warheads ever built. Although he saw little of Jean after he took up his position there, 
Her influence on him is seen in the project itself. The first nuclear weapon that was ever detonated, the Trinity Test Explosion in the New Mexico Desert in the summer of 1945, was named after a poem by the 17th century English poet, John Donne. Much of Oppenheimer's knowledge on European poetry had been expanded by his relationship with Tatlock in the 1930s, who had become an expert herself owing to her father's academic interests. Consequently, it is widely believed that Oppenheimer named the test Trinity, owing to a shared love of the Dunn poem held by himself and Tatlock. Despite his absolute centrality to the Manhattan Project and the running of the Los Alamos Laboratory, Oppenheim was under surveillance during the Second World War by the Central Intelligence Agency and other government bodies in the United States, owing to his ongoing relationship with Tatlock and her years-long associations with the Communist Party of the United States. For instance, we know that when he occasionally visited her in San Francisco around this time, they would often be followed, and their activities recorded by government agencies. There were worries that Jean could be a spy of some kind, or pass information onto the Soviets. So the FBI took these preventive measures to ensure this didn't happen. Tatlock was always something of an emotionally unstable individual. She struggled with many issues, not least her sexuality, being unsure for much of her adult life if she was gay or possibly bisexual. Her complicated sexuality, the government's tracking of communists in America in the 1930s, and her fraught affair with Oppenheimer, left her troubled during the war years. To compound matters, it is generally perceived that she suffered from clinical depression, although the barometers through which such things were measured in the middle of the 20th century were not as clinically effective as they are today. In the summer of 1943, Tatlock appears to have met with Oppenheimer for the last time when he was visiting California. She told him that she wished for their relationship to become more concrete, despite Oppenheimer's marriage to his wife Kitty, a union which was deeply troubled as Kitty was sinking into alcoholism and pill abuse in the mid-1940s. Oppenheimer, though, refused Tatlock's appeal and they would never meet again. She sank first into a depression and by the winter of 1943, was being treated clinically at Mount Zion Hospital in San Francisco. It was during this period that her father John visited her at her apartment one afternoon, as he had not been able to reach her the previous day. Upon arrival, he rang the doorbell various times, but there was no response. Worried, John decided to enter the apartment through a window, and what he saw next shocked him. John reported that he found his daughter's lifeless body lying in the bathroom with her head submerged in the bath. A suicide note was also left. The note read, I am disgusted with everything. To those who loved me and helped me, all love and courage. I wanted to live and to give, and I got paralyzed somehow. I tried like hell to understand, and couldn't. I think I would have been a liability all my life. At least I could take away the burden of a paralyzed soul from a fighting world. John Tatlock moved her body to the sofa and then rummaged through her correspondence, burning letters and photographs in the fireplace. He spent about four hours in the apartment before calling a funeral home, who in turn contacted the police. Most historians agree that Tatlock committed suicide on the 5th of January 1944 by having drowned herself in the bath. Yet, owing to her ties to Oppenheimer and the Communist Party, the strange circumstances of her death and the FBI keeping tabs on her, there have been repeated claims that she might have died from some foul play. During the height of the Second World War, the US took national security secrets very seriously, and potential leaks could be viewed as a threat similar to that of a Japanese or German spy. If a high-ranking intelligence officer viewed Tatlock as a serious threat, it is plausible that they could have ordered her assassination and framed it as suicide. According to the coroner's report, shortly before her death, Tatlock had eaten a full meal. Regarding this, the biographer's burden Sherwin wrote, If it was her intention to drug and then drown herself, as a doctor she had to have known that undigested food slows the metabolizing of drugs into the system. 
The autopsy report contains no evidence that the barbiturates had reached her liver or other vital organs. Neither does the report indicate whether she had taken a sufficiently large dose of barbiturates to cause death. To the contrary, as previously noted, the autopsy determined that the cause of death was asphyxiation by drowning. The authors also state that these curious circumstances are suspicious enough, but the disturbing information contained in the autopsy report is the assertion that the coroner found a faint trace of chloral hydrate in her system. If administered with alcohol, chloral hydrate is the active ingredient of what was then commonly called a Mickey fin, knockout drops. In short, Several investigators have speculated Jean may have been slipped to Mickey and then forcibly drowned in her bathtub. As stated in the book American Prometheus, one doctor observed that if one were clever and wanted to kill someone, chloral hydrate would be the way to do it. In the end though, there's no way to be sure that she was murdered, as there simply isn't enough evidence. Her remains were subsequently cremated. She was just 29 years of age when she passed. Um, if you see the film, and I hope you give the film another chance. Uh, unfortunately, it was too late for one, ready for another, with devastating effects. And as I said, more civilians lost than anything else.
Minister Suzuki announced that the Japanese policy towards the declaration was one of mokusatu, killing with silence. From that moment, the dropping of the atomic bomb was inevitable. In the film, as I said before, they show in his mind of Oppenheimer how he perceived the effects of his bomb done to the Japanese people. To showcase this, I have chosen an anime feature pretty much as devastating, um, warning it's very graphic. I have linked everything in the description below if you want to watch the film for yourself. Um, again, warning, it's very graphic. If there are children in the room, I recommend they do not watch.
even those who managed to survive under rubble or underground died days after from radiation poisoning. In the areas that were bombed, there have been years later found radiation till this day. The atom bomb was one of the most devastating bombs. As we know, the hydrogen bomb, bomb and nuclear weapons came afterwards. Thank you for watching. I hope you do give Oppenheimer the movie a second chance. I enjoyed it very much. I do agree with the comedy awards for not only nominating it, but for the win. And everyone who won from the movie did an excellent job. So yes, it's, it's a movie review, but also a history lesson since it was the most, to date, closest uh, historical movie. Um, and if you're looking at this um, in the future, um, to this day, it's the most historically accurate movie. Um, and you learn from history, don't you? Um, and I do really hope if you quit on the movie, give it a chance. Um, if you didn't understand it, I hope if you watched this video I put together, maybe it helps you understand it a little bit more. Um, there's other videos out there if you don't like the video I put together, but it's important this to to learn from history. Um, you know, there's a lot of history, a lot of historical movies out there, and um, that I recommend documentaries. Documentaries overall are going to be the most real. However, this movie was pretty real <laughs> and pretty shocking. So thanks for watching, and if you liked what you've seen, um, please subscribe, ring that bell, and leave comments, leave comments, please. Thank you so much, and as always, see you in the next one. Goodbye.